Greetings. I hope and trust. I do find you all, my dear friends. We are on lesson of video number five, and we're still continuing on the arrows. And as promised, we want to look at the renegotiation phase. When a contract has been done, remember parties would have gone into an agreement. Now there comes a point where this particular agreement can be revisited. We want to spend the next hour considering this particular portion. Let us spend a moment in prayer before we restart. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you dear Lord for the privilege of considering studies that have to deal with business and the law. As we go into this study, we invite your presence. Give us lucidity of mind and above all, may you touch our minds and give us clarity and a deep understanding. This has been our prayer of faith. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. Before we go on, you know, Christ, as you go into the book of Isaiah, makes this invitation. He says, come, let us reason together. This is a call for renegotiation, and that is what we are looking at today. When you get to section 75 of the Labor Act, this particular section provides for a renegotiation, and it is particularly clear on the parties that can take part in this negotiation exercise. And... Uh, Subsection 1 says, this part shall apply to collective by gaining agreements negotiated by registered trade unions, employers, and employers' organizations or federations thereof, provided that nothing in this part contained shall prevent an unregistered trade union or employers' organization from negotiating a collective by gaining agreement. So what we get here from the get-go is that parties that can come up with this collective agreement would be the employers' organizations and the trade unions. So this bilateral agreement that would come through will then be binding on the business in the industry. We're going to look at how this turns out. Let's quickly roll over to subsection 2. Listen to what it says. Subject to this act and the competence and authority of the parties, Trade unions and employers or employers' organizations may negotiate collective bargaining agreements as to any conditions of employment which are of mutual interest to the parties thereto. So what are these conditions of employment? Let us move on to subsection 3. Without derogation from the generality of subsection 2, a collective bargaining agreement may make provision for A rates of remuneration and minimum wages for different grades and types of occupations. Now, let us just pause here. Take note that these are now rates of remuneration. When we did the contract a few videos ago, we said the contract will not only sound in money, but it will sound in terms of grades. So these are the grades that should be payable to a particular uh, job. So what a collective bargaining agreement can provide for are those particular grades, those rates of the remuneration. So it might say the minimum wage that is going to be paid for this particular industry will be so much. And the grades that will apply for someone who's doing this job, they'll be in grade one, this will be in grade 1B, 2, 2B, and on and on and on. So when you look at all these, what it basically means is that it provides for those provisions to say someone is going to be remunerated at this grade. Now, there's a case we're going to look at later on. This was Cunard Metal Box versus Bonfus Monzora and 23 others. These workers were in the printing industry, but Cunard Metal Box was a combination of an engineering department and a printing department. Now, what happened was the printing industry sat and they came up with a salary that was supposed to apply to this particular industry. So when the employer now received the CBA, what he went on to do was to pay the employees what was determined in terms of the CBA. And then as far as those were in the engineering department, he went on to pay them a little more than those were in the printing department. The employees in the printing department took um, order against this and said, no, this is not order in order. We're being segregated. Why are those in the engineering department? 
being paid more than us who are in the printing department. And they went on to take us to, to strike. That was sometime in 2004. So we'll come back to this. But the point I seek to raise at this point is that the CBA is the one that will determine how much those salaries would be. So because employers are represented by an employer's association in that particular association, it does not always mean every employer is able to pay the, 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 the new rates or the, the new terms and conditions that have been set. So at that point, this particular employer is going to seek an exemption. So we'll look at that as we get to section 75. But so far, what you need to understand is that the collective bargaining agreement is binding on all the employers in that particular industry. And it will be binding for a set period. It will be 12 months minimum. We'll get to that. Now let's look at B. Benefits for employees. As mentioned, these would vary. And uh, from our last um, discussion where we're looking at deductions, looking at tax law, you'd uh, appreciate that the benefits are going to be corporeal and incorporeal. As long as there is an ascertainable monetary value that can be assigned to the benefit, it counts towards that particular employee's benefits. Let's look at C. C provides as follows. Deductions which an employer may make from employees' wages, including deductions for membership fees and union dues and deductions which an employer may be required or permitted by law or by order of any competent court to make. We did rehash this as we're looking at section 12 uh, around subsections 5 and 6, where we looked at some of these deductions and we say these deductions that will be compelled by law there will be our A, AIDS levy. We're going to have your payee, pay as you earn. And the other one that you're going to have is the national social security deduction. So these are the three basic deductions that we looked at. But you'll notice that a CBA can provide for further deductions. And some of these deductions, I'll speak to the um, educational and uh, welfare institutions, that's the um, uh, CBA that uh, affects our operations, you will notice that there is a deduction of 2% from the employee's salary and an equivalent 2% on the employer's side. So this 2% now goes to the Employment Council. So these are some of the deductions that will be provided for in that CBA. And D, methods of calculating all factors for adjusting rates of pay and the dates, times, and modes of payment. Now, notice that these are a replica of what is provided for in Section 12. Section 12 simply demanded the intervals of pay when these people are going to be paid, and it also de de demanded the mode of calculation of their salaries. So these are the grades and so on. But what you will find here also provided for in the CBAs would be a CBA will place you in a grade. For example, say you're in grade 1. Uh, in the following year, where grade one is at a certain percentage, what would happen is that whatever that uh, percentage was, 100% of it, in the following year, it notches you up, where you are going to be notched up maybe by 1% for every year of service. So that kind of service recognition or service credit is then computed and your, your, your salary, someone who is starting today and someone who has been on the job for five years, even though they're doing the same job, they're not going to be at the same rate. So you'll do this when you get to your human resources or personal law. But for now, I want you to appreciate that there is a service recognition that goes with the number of years that you have put in. It differentiates employees who are on the same job. So you need to take note of that. I think if I'm not mistaken, it used to be 1% for every year that you work up to about 10% or so, I'm not sure. Now let's look at E. All issues pertaining to overtime, piecework, periods of vacation, and vacation pay and constraints thereon. So when you get to the vacation, we've already addressed this in part in passing, where we would have said an employee who works uh, for a year would accrue 30 days of vacation leave. And thereafter, they'll continue to accrue these days up to a maximum of 90 days um, in the whole span of their work life. But it goes on to provide that, you know, there are issues of overtime. If I'm not mistaken, an employee was not supposed to work for something like uh, 49 hours. Now, you'll also notice that when you get to the um, uh, overtime, the overtime provides, generally in the sector that I've worked in, 
uh, an employee would have worked for something like um, nine hours per day, um, multiply that by five. So the range is between 40 and 45. That would constitute your normal working week. But in that normal working week, the overtime that will be provided for is about 49 hours per week. And employees can agree to take on that extra time, but they should not go over 54 hours in any week. So this is the provision that you would find in your CBA. These are issues that will not ordinarily be regulated by your Labor Relations Act. So the business person you are, you're supposed to go and check these times and you'll find them stipulated in the CBA. If they are not in the CBA of the industry, they are going to appear in the contracts of employment. And we looked at these as hours of work, where we say the hours of work does not only uh, detail in terms of time, but it is also of the full-time hour equivalence. What are you doing within those hours? Now let's move on to F. The demarcation of the appropriate categories and classes of employment and their respective functions. So what we're looking at here is these are employees in terms of managerial, support staff, or ancillary workers. That is how you're going to demarcate them. So what the CBA ordinarily covers are employees who are non-managerial. Those who are managerial will ordinarily have separate or independent contracts which they can negotiate on because of their unique skill set. They are in a position to make even greater demands on their conditions of service. At G, the conditions of employment for apprentices. This one is straightforward. H, the number of hours of work and the times of work with respect to all or some of the employees. So you're going to notice that H is very much akin to E because you cannot talk about overtime unless the hours are known. So the hours of work are going to be ordinarily, when do you start work, do we have a break, and after how long do we have a break? So you'll notice that in most CPAs, there's a provision that an employee cannot go on for more than five hours without taking a break. So there'll be a provision for that particular break. And even the times, the Labor Act provides that once a week, an employee must be given a 24-hour uninterrupted rest. And if you go into the book of Exodus, it has already been provided. That 24 uninterrupted hour of rest begins on Friday and ends on Saturday from 6 to 6 ordinarily. That would be your 24 hours in terms of the Bible. But when you come to the Labor Act, the 24 hours can be on any particular day. It is not um, defined to be on a Sunday, Saturday, or whatever. But at least once a week, you must have that uninterrupted time of rest. Let us look at I, the requirements of occupational safety. So what we're looking at here is how the environment can be safe. We're talking about protective clothing. So when you're talking about protective clothing, we'll be looking at your ordinary work suits. You'll be looking at uh, your aprons. You can be looking at your helmets. But um, this has obviously taken a new twist nowadays. So if we're talking about occupational safety, we'll be talking about sanitizing. So the, the UN regulations come into effect immediately. So when you talk about uh, sanitizing, you need to have means of making sure that people's temperatures are checked as they go into the workplace. You want to make sure that there's a sanitizing sport. You want to make sure even that there is uh, maybe for, for some other plants, you could have an isolation bay should someone show some um, signs of um, being under the weather. And then the other thing besides these, you also want to look at J, the maintenance of and access by parties to records of employment and pay. So what we're looking at here is where you could have your service records. An employee should be given access to these. My employer provides that every two years, at least you must have a record of your service. And what would this record of service detail? Who you are, your employment job, I mean your title, and you're going to have your grade, what is it, and how much the salary was. And this helps towards um, determining your service credit for your gratuity. It would help in determining your service credit towards pension. If you have a contributor pension, this is where it will come in. How long have you been contributing? That particular record is going to come in very handy. Let's look at K, procedures for dealing with disputes within an undertaking or industry.
Now, on procedures for dealing with disputes, these would be your codes of conduct in the workplace. So these will ordinarily provide for an employer representation, employee representation in equal parties. They'll come together, make a vote upon hearing the issue. We're going to look at this when we cover removal from the workplace. So where you have an industry code of conduct, it is going to be the one that is applicable. If you have a company registered code of conduct, you will then have to register it with the National Employment Council so that it can be recognized and applicable. Because if you dismiss someone using the wrong code, this will cost you. We're going to come back to this. You must make sure you are using the right code to discipline anyone because whosoever is not dismissed in terms of an employment code of conduct is deemed to be unfairly dismissed regardless of what happened regardless of what happened. We're going to look at this when we get to removal. Let us move on. Housing and transport facilities, or in their absence, an allowance for the same. Now, what we're looking at is where someone resides outside um, the employer's um, quarters. You have not been uh, availed with um, accommodation, and the um, employer does not give you transportation in his or her own um, vehicles. In that particular setup, you're going to find that the CBA will provide that you're going to have a house allowance, you're going to have a transport allowance. For the farming sector, there is even a lighting allowance that applies to those people. So these are some things that are negotiated by the trade unions. And at M, there are, there are quite a lot of them. Measures to combat workplace violence and handling its aftermath. This is straightforward. So should you find uh, any outbreak of a violence, how are you going to deal with that? And N, the following measures to foster the viability of undertakings and high levels of employment were applicable. Namely, these are the measures. One, to promote high levels of productivity. Two, to promote economic competitiveness. Three, to promote economic and environmental sustainability. And four, to mitigate the cost of living. So these are measures that are going to be uh, advanced. So bottom line, I, I love the way these have been set in terms of their criteria. Number one, it's about productivity. Remember, the relationship is all about making money. It's about profits. Like it or not, we are not employed so that we, are, we go into social arrangement with the employer. The reason for our employment is so that profits can be made, so that production can be made. And these assets, this inventory must move off from our shelves and go and rest with the customer. And then, of course, economic competitiveness. What are we talking, talking about here? We must be able to trade and have, an, um, they call it the balance of trade. I think we did that in accounting. So a balance of trade is where you, um, how much are you exporting vis-a-vis -vis what you are importing? So as a country, we have a balance of trade. So every other organization also has a balance of trade. If you find yourself um, spending more towards your production than you are realizing from your sales, this, is, this becomes the balance of trade in the um, uh, simplest sense. So you want to make sure you are not spending more on purchases compared to what you spend on in sales. So the CBA must ensure that companies, in other words, are viable. They are viable in the industry where they operate, in the territory where they operate. And then number three, we also want to promote uh, economic and environmental stability. So you'll notice that one and two will generally come into economic stability. And then we also want to mitigate the cost of living. These are usually provided for by the consumer price index, where you want to say, how much does it cost, cost to um, feed a family of five? So you want to make sure that you are productive enough to avail salaries that are going to cover these expensive expenses for your families. Let's look at subsection number four. Nothing contained in any collective bargaining agreement shall prevent either or both of the parties from seeking to renegotiate or amend the agreement after 12 months of its operation in order to take account of changed circumstances in the, in the industry or undertaking concerned. Now, notice that there are parameters that are set here. 
nothing will preclude a renegotiation after 12 months. Now, what I've noticed on the ground, though, you'll notice that where the, the economy is on a landslide, as it were, you'll find that these negotiations are redone, and they seem to be redone at intervals that are less than 12 months. I, I'm, I'm yet to, to take it up with uh, some of my friends in the NEC to say, this almost sets um, a, a limit that says, you know, the, th the minimum we can do is renegotiate after 12 months. And, and the reason is pretty simple. If you're doing it on a 12-month basis, that means at least you can put it in your financial year plan. But you're going to find that at some point, I remember we had um, NEC rates changing like every three months. That was during the hyperinflation of the 2008, uh, leading to the dollarization. And of late, I've seen them begin to change about twice in a year. It seems like there's a bit of a movement now. Um, and this seems to be uh, within the 12 months, and yet the guaranteed renegotiation should be after 12 months expire. Let's look at number five. Listen to what it says. A collective bargaining agreement shall not contain any provision which is inconsistent with this act. This is the Labor Act. Any other enactment or any collective bargaining agreement which contains any such provision shall to the extent of such inconsistency be construed with such modifications, qualifications, adaptations, and exceptions as may be necessary to bring it into conformity with this act or such other enactment. We did look at the supremacy clause that was section 2A, paragraph 3, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, we stress that the Labor Act takes uh, supremacy over any other instrument that is inconsistent with it. Now, this was in relation to your statutory instruments and your acts. Now, when you get to a collective bargaining agreement, so where we have parties that have come together, the trade union and the employer's organization, and they have resolved to come up with a position that is contrary to the provisions of the Labor Act. When they do so, that particular con I mean, in our convention, whatever they agree upon is going to be adapted. It's going to be modified to the extent that it becomes compliant with the Act. And this must remind you of um, uh, part one where we looked at a statutory instrument. That should, that should have been section 134 of the Constitution, paragraph C, which provides as follows. Statutory instruments must be consistent with the Acts of Parliament under which they are made you'll notice that this is generally the same phraseology. What applies to the CBAs would also apply to the statutory instruments. They ought to be in compliance. Let's look at number six. The existence of a collective bargaining agreement shall not preclude an employer or his employees from agreeing to the introduction of higher rates of pay or other more favorable conditions of employment before the expiry of such collective bargaining agreement. So, however, that the rights and the interests of the employees are not thereby diminished or adversely affected. So what we are looking at here is a scenario whereby the law generally operates on a basis of minimums. So let's say the law has provided that the salary shall be 500 US dollars. If the employer wishes to pay 700 US dollars, nothing precludes the employer from doing so. Let's say we have agreed on $500 and midway, this fund has been eroded. The employer says, this is not sufficient to shoulder the needs of my employees and goes on to top it up to $600. Nothing precludes the employer from doing so. And they can do so even before this particular agreement has expired. And the expiry period being the 12 months that we referred to earlier on. The only condition is that if the employer wishes to pay more than that which is set, the prescribed minimum, the employer will have to endorse this on the collective bargaining agreement so that it is reflected as a obtaining condition for that period. Now, no matter how hard we try, not all of us are always going to be level. Some of us are going to be the, this finger, some of us are going to be the Long finger, some of us are going to be the thin finger. So you're going to find scenarios where some employers are not going to be able to foot the bill. 
When you are not able to foot the bill, note that you're going to have to come through section 76. Now listen to what seven, section 76 basically provides for. At subsection 1, when any party to the negotiation of a collective bargaining agreement alleges incapacity as a ground of his inability to agree to any terms or conditions or to any alteration of any terms or conditions thereof, it shall be the duty of such party to make full disclosure of his financial position, duly supported by all relevant accounting papers and documents to the other party. What does this simply mean? If you come and say you do not have money, prove it beyond reasonable doubt that you cannot afford it. And how are you going to prove it to the other party? Produce your financial statement. And the financial statement ordinarily would not be one that is produced by yourself. It must be one that is audited by a third party who is not yourself so that um, there can be a conviction that indeed you cannot afford to make this payment, to honor this payment. So this is something um, that is generally designed to um, dissuade the employer from going in this direction because not many of these employers would want to really um, air their dirty laundry on how they are performing financially. So many are really prompted towards ensuring that uh, they comply and they provide for these bargaining agreements. Let us go to subsection 3. Listen to what it says. Any person who fails or refuses to comply with a determination that is binding upon him in terms of subsection 2 shall be guilty of an offense and liable to a fine not exceeding level 7 or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding two years or both such fine and such imprisonment. What I want to stress here is that this person is going to find themselves most probably imprisoned for two years. And which employer would really want to undergo that? Two years of imprisonment? Surely that's a long time. Even two days is way too long to spend in prison. So um, what have we covered so far before we move on to collective job actions? What we've covered so far in the first part of this video is that the terms and conditions of employment are subject to renegotiation. And this renegotiation takes place at um, trade union and employers organization level. And it shall be the responsibility of the employee, I mean, employment council to make sure that these are effected in terms of section 62 of the Labor Act. So the employment council is the one that is going to give effect clothe this with um, the power of law to make sure that it is um, complied with. So should you have a scenario where someone wishes not to comply with that, they are going to be subject to a maximum of two years in prison. But should you honestly not be able to do so, an exemption is still available. You go through the process of proving your inability to pay for a certain period and of course this would be valid for 12 months. That's the uh, valid, val validity of um, this uh, agreement. Now let's go to the job actions. There is a lot that we're going to find here. Job actions are generally provided for in section 104. So what is a job action? These are what we usually call strikes. They will vary. It could be uh, an outright strike. It could be a sit-in. It could be a ghost law. We could have even a lockout that is done by the employer locking out the employees that you're not going to come in unless you, you, you accede to my conditions. So what happens here is that the collective um, uh, action, we said there's a collective bargaining agreement. What it does basically, it's a negotiation at a numbers level. The collective bargaining agreement is done at um, a structural level. And then you're going to have um, a job action. A job action ordinarily takes place within the employment environment in the workplace. So what happens in the job action is that there are those who are going to say what the employer wants from me is a service for me to perform a skill. So the only thing I can withdraw in order to get the employer's attention is my skill. It's my effort. So what the employee does is to remove that effort. And what will the employer do? The employer is going to uh, say, what you actually need from me is not a job. You need to be remunerated. Remember, 
An employer is one who remunerates or makes an undertaking to remunerate. You notice this? So because what the employer does exclusively is to pay, what the employee does exclusively is to work. So what the employee can remove is work. I'll take that away. What the employer will do is to take away remuneration. So each one of these, like Moses, what do you have in your hand? The employee has a skill. The employer has remuneration, which will sound in either corporeal or incorporeal terms. So the employer will take away that. So this particular negotiation also moves from that structural position and comes now to an employee's position. What happens at employee level, not at trade union per se? Listen to what section 104, subsection 2 provides for. Subject to subsection 4, no employees, workers' committee, trade union, employers' organization or federation shall resort to collective job action unless... So notice this now. I want to underscore employees and employers' committees. Now, these ones are exclusively in the workplace. So you could have a scenario where you have a trade union going on to call for a job action across the whole uh, industry. Uh, you, you, you remember that there are these uh, usually uh, here the men use the Progressive Teachers Union of Zimbabwe and uh, the Rural Teachers uh, Union of Zimbabwe are twos or something like that. Now, these are trade unions that can call for strikes across their unions, across their members. So unions can do that, but that is not our primary interest for now. And you could have a scenario where all these unions can come together and mobilize for a stay away from work. That is, a, whereby all the workers generally stay away from work. And you could have stay aways that are called by political parties for political reasons. Those are different and beyond the scope of our discussion now. I want to zero in on the workers' committees and the employees. And section 104, subsection 2, says none of these can call for a strike. They cannot resort to a collective job action unless two primary conditions have been met. And these conditions are as follows. Go to paragraph A in subsection 2. 14 days written notice of intent to resort to such action, specifying the grounds for the intended action has been given. 14 days have to be given. And this notice must specify the grounds for the intended action. So why? Why, why, why all this? The court also took time to address this. There is a case that was uh, um, case number 89 of 2005. It was decided by the Supreme Court. And Justice um, Tijau Siku, as he then was, uh, presided over this. What happened in this case? Now, you had a scenario whereby uh, 56 or so net one employees went on um, a strike. Basically, among other things, they, 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 it was basically their terms and conditions of employment. As far as their salaries are concerned, and the fact that uh, net one uh, administration was being vindictive uh, towards uh, those who were part of the workers' committee, amongst other things. So what these um, people did is, after having um, given notice that they were going to go on a strike on the 15th of June 2004, negotiations then ensued. As negotiations were ongoing, it so happens that uh, things didn't go according to plan, and ultimately some around 20 May 2004, that was the following month, they went on strike. So when they went on this strike, the employer responded by dismissing the employees. And all these employees were dismissed. And the reason was you went on an unlawful strike. And having gone on to challenge this, this matter was ultimately escalated to the Supreme Court. Now, what then happened here? Uh, I, I want you to take note of... Uh, Justice Chijiao Siku's, um, the, 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 the judge of the appellate court, listen to what he says. He says, the employees did not give the requisite written notice of their intention to go on strike 
on 15 June 2004. The notice given on 20 May 2004 had expired and could not be carried forward indefinitely. So what I want us to notice here is what the judge is stressing is that at every interval where you want to go on and strike, you're going to give a notice that says 14 days from today, I am going on a strike. Should the 14 days expire and you do not proceed to go on strike, you must issue a fresh notice. Are you getting what the law is now? So this is the principle. This is the ratio descendendi. These people did not issue a fresh notice. So when they later on went on the second strike, of course, they did raise some issues to the minister then, Mutimiri, to say uh, we are being victimized because we are deemed to be um, uh, favoring or even uh, leaning towards supporting the MDC. And because of that, we're being victimized for a political opinion, which is unfounded. So the judge then went on to say the issues that they raised later on as they are writing to the minister are not the issues that they detailed in their first notice of intending to go on a strike. And because of that, this particular action was deemed to be unlawful and the employees were dismissed. So it is very, very, very integral to the process that one must serve this notice. And this notice is going to be served to these parties. Number one, to the person you are going to be striking against. That is your employer. Secondly, not only to your employer, to the appropriate employment council. Thirdly, to the appropriate trade union or employers organization or federation in the case of members of a trade union, employers organization or federation partaking in a collective job action where the trade union or employers organization or federation is not itself resorting to such action. So you must then notify your union if you are resorting to such an action. And B, listen to this one, an attempt has been made to conciliate the dispute and a certificate of no settlement has been issued in terms of section 93. This one is a separate condition. Let me just recap. The first condition issue a 14 days notice. Number two, make sure you have secured a certificate of no settlement in terms of section 93. What section 93 basically provides for is that you're going to go for conciliation before a labor officer or before a designated um, NEC agent, National Employment Council agent. Appear before that designated person and if your matter is not resolved, you shall be issued with a certificate of no settlement. If you now have that certificate of no settlement, proceed for a strike. So this is what then happened in the case I referred to earlier in Cornered Metal Box versus Bonfus Monzora. This one was a Supreme Court case of 2004. Remember what happened there? What happened is a case whereby in, um, in an enterprise, this is a cut out metal. You had engineering employees and printing employees by departments. The employees in the engineering department were awarded a higher salary than those in the printing department. Those who were in the printing department had been given their salaries based on what their industry had determined to be the relevant salaries. So because of that payment, they went on to challenge this on the grounds that they were being segregated. So what they then on went on to do, number one, they sent in a notice that they intended to take an unspecified action. Now, this is where now the first thing they did wrong, an unspecified action. And yet, what did provision one provide for? It provided that you must spell out the grounds on which you intend to resort to this action. That was subsection two, subs, I mean, paragraph A. You must specify the grounds for the intended action. So they did not even specify the grounds for the intended action. Now, to make matters worse, this is what the court actually dwelt on predominantly. They did not secure the uh, certificate of no settlement from a labor relations officer. Without that certificate of no settlement, 
having gone on to give notice that they intended to go on a collective job action. The employer, through its representatives, went on to give them a verbal warning. Desist from going on a strike, retract from this, and return to work. The employees proceeded to go on a strike. And after the verbal warning, they were given a written warning, and thereafter, they were dismissed. Now, the matter escalated through the labor officers, went on to the labor court, and finally landed in the Supreme Court. In view of the failure by the respondents to follow the proper procedure, this is Section 104, Subsection 2, as far as the notice is concerned and the certificate of no settlement. As prescribed above, it is clear that the collective job action was unlawful. The respondents raised other issues, which they said were irregularities in the proceedings on which the court should have set aside the decision of the disciplinary committee. I love this. Even assuming there were such irregularities proved, that does not make an unlawful job action lawful. Now let us go to the ratio decedendi. What did the Supreme Court determine? When you go on an unlawful job action, even if there may be irregularities that would have arisen in the way this matter would have been prosecuted or resolved, that does not confer regularity on an unlawful action. It still remains unlawful. It is tainted from the get-go. So it does not become proper just because you have complained about it. It still remains irregular. So what are we stressing here in a nutshell? When we are in a workplace, we want to make sure that as employees, we do it right and we do it lawfully. When we are negotiating, when we are about to withdraw that power, we want to make sure that you are withdrawing that power lawfully. And in order to do so lawfully, give notice. In order to do so lawfully, you need to secure a certificate of no settlement. Without these two, you do not want to arbitrarily withdraw your power, withdraw your work, withdraw your skill. When you do so, remember when we looked at um, contracts, you are going to be in breach of your contract. How would you be in breach of your contract? You would have not performed the duties that you expressed yourself available to perform for the employer. And for that breach of contract, which is absence without any authorization, the employer can charge you. The employer can decide not to pay you because you have not worked for those days. The employer can also go on to dismiss you. So you want to make sure you're keeping these at the back of your mind at all times. And then from the employer's side, you want to appreciate that this process is not necessarily a process of fighting. It is a renegotiation phase. So we must all come to it with good faith, which is provided for, I think it's in section 75, where you're looking at um, trade unions and uh, the employers' organizations, they must negotiate in good faith. So even where the employer has decided to withdraw their skill, we must still negotiate in good faith. They are not fighting the employer. They are renegotiating the terms of the contract. If we all approach this with this view, we will not be looking at people who strike as being ungrateful. We will not be looking at people who go into collective action as being politically motivated. They are renegotiating the terms of the contract. That's all it is. That's all it is. Now, when you look at that, from that perspective, there comes a time when employers can become overly, overly vindictive, overly vindictive. And where would this arise? You would want to look at subsection number four. You would also have scenarios where the employees can become overzealous. Overzealous. I'm, I'm reminded of, um, was that um, another strike in the, in the plantations? Um, I'll, I'll put the name down here if I, if, 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 if I remember it. Now, what, what, what happened there is a scenario where employees went on a strike, and while they were on a strike, they went on to be destructive and they banned property. 
and the employer lost property because of that in the plantation. And because of that, there is no way you'd expect the law to come to your aid when you become violent, when you destroy property. Such a strike has gone beyond removal of your labor, removal of your skill. But when you go on to violate the rights of others, the law will work against you. Now, the other part, as an employer, you need to know that there are boundaries. There are certain things that you cannot do. When you do them, you are encroaching. You are just over, you know, exerting yourself on the employee. Remember, there is an imbalance here. The employee can only just take away his what? His labor. Now, when the employer goes on to be vindictive, there is a case that um, we found um, that was decided in relation to subsection 4. Remember, when we're reading subsection 2, it says, subject to subsection 4, no employees, workers' committee, trade union, employer, employers' organization or federation shall resort to collective job action unless it goes on and on. Now, let's go to this subsection 4, which is referred to there. Subsection 4 says, nothing in subsection 1 and 2 or 3, 2 is the one we've just considered, shall be deemed to prevent collective job action from being resorted to. And these are the conditions under which whatever formalities come in subsection 2 would not apply. Where would these formalities not apply? And these formalities being, number one, the notice period. Number two, you don't need to secure um, a certificate of no settlement. And these are the conditions, A, in order to avoid any occupational hazard, which is reasonably feared to pose an immediate threat to the health or safety of the person's consent. So when you have a scenario where people are in uh, the health sector, they have not been availed with protective clothing, such as their gloves, masks, um, a a a a any protective equipment, PPE, if it has not been availed, such a person will not be required to give you 14 days notice and continue in that environment. They can strike as soon as those things are not in place. I, I hope this is clear. And secondly, they need not secure a certificate of no settlement which can take up to 30 days before it is issued by the labor relations officer while continuing to operate in a hazardous environment. Because this has to do with life. It is an inalienable right, the right to life. It cannot be endangered. You remember even as we're looking at um, Section 11, no employer is going to employ someone who is below the age of 18 in an environment that could do harm to their health. And this is the protection that is availed to those who are above 18. They can always withdraw their labor. They can make that decision. They can make that decision. Now let's go to B. This one is the one that was decided. In defense of immediate and immediate threat to the existence of a workers' committee or a registered trade union. There is an interesting case that happened sometime in 2003. Case number 62. This was between uh, First Mutual and Mozivi. And uh, this was uh, decided in 2003. The facts of this case are as follows. Basically, First Mutual had um, an a, a workers' com committee that represented all employees. And uh, its managerial employees who were in grades 1 up to 9 did not have a workers' committee. And in terms of Section 23 of the Labor Act, they are entitled to form their own workers' committee. So the workers' committee was formed. The managerial workers' committee, that is. They sought to renegotiate their conditions with the employer in the workplace. The employer said, no, 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 the constitution of this committee is wrong. It's inclusive of people who are managerial and non-managerial. There's an issue here, so they got the matter referred, re, 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 men referred to the uh, labor court eventually. As the issue was still being discussed, guess what the employer did? This is what I was talking about, about, about being vindictive. The employer... I mean, started um, regrading, demoting the employees who had been in the managerial employment workers committee. They demoted them and regraded them to less favorable conditions, such that they ended up not being managerial employees. 
and they were now supposed to be covered by the Common um, Workers' Committee that existed. So in so doing, these gentlemen and ladies who were in the Managerial Workers' Committee, guess what they do? They then come together and they say, the Workers' Committee is now under threat. The employer does not want to negotiate new conditions with us, and he now threatens the existence of the Workers' Committee they proceeded to go on a strike. And when they went on that strike, the employer responded by dismissing, dismissing all the employees, more than 100 of them or so. They were all dismissed. So when they were dismissed, this matter was escalated and made its way to the Supreme Court. Otherwise, it was around a, a late 90s case. So when it got there, this is what Chijiao Siku said. I, 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 found, I found his finding and uh, even um, what he says in dicta there to be quite instructive. Listen to what he says. Before the matter was resolved by the Labour Tribunal, the appellant embarked on a restructuring exercise whose net effect was to render members of the interim executive of the Managerial Workers Committee non-managerial employees. The direct consequence of the appellant's conduct in this regard was to abolish the Managerial Workers Committee by rendering all its members disqualified for appointment or election to that workers' committee. This conduct of the appellant is more than a threat to the managerial workers' committee. It is an actual and direct attack on the existence of the managerial workers' committee. It is quite apparent from this conduct and the subsequent conduct of the appellant that it wished to prevent the formation of the Management Workers' Committee. It is difficult to imagine a greater and more imminent threat to the Managerial Workers' Committee than this. Now, I, I, I just want to look at what the judge points out here. So for the employer, you know, when you begin to target people and you weed them out so that they are not part of a workers' committee, when employees strike, such a strike is going to be lawful. It shall be lawful. Do not do it. Do not be heavy-handed. It will not help your cause. It will not. It will not. As if the judge was not done. Listen to what he says about these rights. The above rights cannot be alienated. Alienated. Right. The above rights cannot be alienated or suspended at the whim of an employer without due process of the law. So when you talk about alienation, this is where you are separating. You cannot take away a right from an employee without due process. What is this right? The right to have a workers' committee in the workplace. The right to belong to a trade union in the workplace. You cannot take these away at the click of a finger like that, you cannot. To do so will do you more harm. It will do you more harm. Do not do it. Do not do it. And this is what uh, came of this. You need to follow due process. What is this due process? The employee must be given the right to be heard. The employee must be given the right to present their facts. The employee must be given a right to call witnesses and to cross-examine whosoever will testify against them. The employee must be given the right to address the committee in mitigation and even to be represented by a lawyer in that particular meeting. So do not become overzealous as the employer just because you can withdraw the salary, because you can fire, fire following due process. So the respondent and his fellow employees were within their rights. It continues to form as they did the Managerial Workers' Committee. If there was a dispute as to the managerial status of some of the members of the interim executive, that dispute could only be resolved by the Labour Tribunal, that is the Labour Court. Until the matter had been resolved, the respondent was entitled, in terms of Section 1044, Paragraph B, of the Act, to take or take part in the collective job action in defense of an immediate threat to the existence of that managerial workers' committee. So what have we addressed so far? Number one, as far as uh, 
collective job actions, collective bargainings. Collective bargainings can be done at a structural level. And they will be done at trade union and employers' organizations coming together. And the National Employment Council will see to it that these bargainings are, I mean, these agreements are enforced. And having enforced them, they are clothed with law. If the employer cannot sustain the renegotiated conditions or terms of service, the employer will have to prove that indeed he or she cannot afford it. And this collective um, bargaining also takes place within the workplace, unique to every enterprise. And at that point, the employees can come together where a workers' committee has resorted to a job action. We do not look at these job actions, but I've said there's a sit-in. You could have a ghost law. You could have a full-blown strike. You could have a lockout. All these are actions that can be taken. So when it has been called for, members who then resort to this action must do predominantly two things according to subsection 2. Number one, issue a 14-day notice. Number two, secure a certificate of no settlement. These are the issues that were decided in the Carnot case and in the, um, the other case was the Net One case. And there would be a scenario where these formalities will not apply. They will not apply in terms of subsection 4, where a health hazard has arisen. Or, a, um, I mean, a workers' committee is under threat. And this was the case that was decided later on in First Mutual. That was a 2003 case. My dear friends, what have we uh, come to appreciate so far? When we make contracts, they are not cast in stone. They can be revisited. They can be renegotiated. And when they are being renegotiated, let us approach this as a business, as a business negotiation, not a reason to become violent, vagabonds, and even go on to destroy property. Do not do so. Even when we go into the negotiations, we want to make sure we are ensuring that the cost of living is maintained as juxtaposed with production and economical activity. So these are things that we need to take into account. It's a business negotiation. That's what it is. Now, as we come to the end of uh, the employment section, in our next section, we want to look at how we can get to a position where someone has to be removed from the payroll, removal from the payroll. That will be our last section in the employment section. Until we meet again, may God bless you.